You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. Welcome back to Nighttime's coverage of the disappearance of Holly Ellsworth Clark. When we last met, we were joined by Elle, who is both Holly's employer and one of the driving forces beyond the search for her. Tonight, in the third part of this series, we're going to shift our attention to something that simply has to be addressed. That being the striking similarities between Holly's story and that of another covered on this show. The 2012 disappearance of then 26-year-old Emma Filipov. To me, as soon as I learned of Holly's story from the earliest news reports, it hit me like a tragic case of deja vu. A missing young woman, an artist, who after a period of unusual behavior places a disturbing phone call home requesting a plane ticket. The police are called, they don't intervene, and before the family arrives, the young woman walks off into the cold air despite being inappropriately dressed for the weather. Perhaps I read into things too far, but that's a pretty specific series of events, and I'm not the only one who sees it that way. Within days of Holly's disappearance, I began receiving messages from listeners of the show explaining the similarities. And now that I've covered Holly's case on the show, the messages have increased substantially. This topic, the topic being the similarities between these two cases, is well worth a discussion. And that's what this episode's about. To join me in this, I've reached out to my friend Tyler Hooper, who, like me, has dove deep into Emma Filipoff's case in the past. But before Tyler and I get to it, I just want to make a few things clear. Neither of us have any belief that Emma Filipoff and Holly Clark's stories are specifically connected in any way. We do, however, believe that the similarities in the cases are stunning, and that many of the same factors are likely at play. Also, as we'll be discussing both cases, for those of you who don't know Emma Filipoff's story, we will be explaining the basics to keep you up to speed and into the conversation, but there's a heck of a lot more to her story than we're going to get into here. I've done an eight-part series titled Emma Filipoff is Missing, in which the story is told in much greater detail. So consider listening to those episodes as well. But again, it's not required that you've heard that first. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. In this episode of Nighttime, we'll be joined by freelance journalist Tyler Hooper. And our topic is the tragic coincidences shared by Holly Clark and Emma Filipoff. So t- Tyler, it's been a while since you've been on the show. We last talked here, uh, the the finale of the series about Emma Filipoff. Ooh, what's been going on with you since uh, since then? I guess that's been six months now. Yeah, it's been a little while. Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, I'm uh, I'm working on this book proposal about this shipwreck here in BC, and that's kind of my main side project right now. It, it may end up also being a podcast at some point. Um, I know you and I have talked about that a few times. I have yet to commit to it, but... Uh, yeah, just just working, uh, paying the bills, and then looking for interesting projects to uh, you know sink my hooks into. And uh, when you told me about this, I uh, I was very excited that you thought of me because I think it's a very interesting case. Yeah, and it, regular listeners of the show will will remember you from that episode with Emma, as well as you were on for the episode about Granger Taylor who who disappeared. Uh, for people who who don't know those episodes or don't know you, tell me a, a little bit about a little of your background. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know me or haven't heard me on Jordan's podcast, um, for a while, I was a pretty regular feature contributor to Vice, especially Vice Canada. Uh, I haven't contributed in a while, doesn't mean I'm not going to, uh, but I've written a lot about crime and missing persons, uh, Emma Filipoff, uh, Granger Taylor, Art Williams, some names that if you Google have some pretty interesting stories. Uh, I had a documentary made about my Granger Taylor story at the CBC. Uh, my day job, I work in government, uh, and then, you know, I try and podcast, do documentaries, feature writing and stuff on the side. So, you know, I consider myself a freelance freelance writer at this point and semi-journalist, um, depending on what I'm writing about. But, uh, yeah, I like, I like stories that involve uh, a mystery, uh, something interesting, and, uh, you know, any twists and turns always uh, drags me in, like, like this one here, so. Yeah, so... 
given your background, it's it's uh, obvious how we became connected. So it was you did that long form piece for Vice about Emma Filipov's story when I was kind of in the middle of my series. So we ended up connecting in. We, we're like um, brothers from other mothers. We both have the same kind of taste in the weird stories and the mysteries. And so when I was doing this episode, this series on Holly's story, immediately I thought of you because, you know, these things were kind of coming up as I was learning more and more about Holly that I was like, you know, it was just really uh, blowing my mind. And I and I was thinking, like, I can't wait to tell, talk to Tyler about this. Did Did you know anything about Holly's story before I wrote to you? Like, did you know about this, you know, two weeks ago? No, the funny thing is, is when you when you Facebooked me um, asking me about this, if I knew about it, I almost immediately I didn't know, so I went to Google it. And your next message was, "Don't don't Google it. I have an episode coming out," and I had to stop myself because no, I hadn't I had not heard from I had not heard of it. I mean, I I maybe in passing through the news, but it was not something that like when you said the name, it, it stuck out to me. Um, so it was a surprise. Yeah, and of course, this all happened in in Ontario. You're in BC. I'm in Nova Scotia. The, the reason I became so aware of it initially is I had um, earlier this year in January, right when Holly went missing, I was in the middle of like remastering and re-releasing my episodes about Emma. So people who were listening to my show were kind of tuned into, into that. And then I was started getting these emails about, you know, did you like Jordan, did you hear about this case going on in Ontario? And they would give me in the email just a little blurb, like a young woman who was an artist had wrote had like contacted her parents wanting a plane ticket home and then disappeared. And I'm like reading these emails, being like, Are these people really mixing up like what my episode's about? Or like do they not know what's happening? And and then it was like after I got maybe two or three of those emails. I Googled her name and as I read the article, it was like my jaw was on the floor being like, this is like the exact story that I'm covering now. And like with so many similarities, like what was when when I told you about it and you waited and listened to my episode, at what point did you realize, you know, the the connection or the similarities this Holly story shares with Emma? Like when did that happen during the episode? It happened pretty early in the episode, especially when you, uh, you you delved into with her father about her moving to Toronto Hamilton to kind of follow her dreams. I kind of felt like that was very similar to Emma and that maybe Emma didn't know what dream she was following, but she was moving away to, to find herself a little bit. And that to me, I mean, you'd already hinted at it and planted the seed for me, but that really to me right away, I was intrigued. And then obviously once we get to her living at this house, and these strange circumstances um, and the way she disappeared, I was like, oh, this is this is eerily similar um, in a way that it's hard to ignore, I think. And I think the comparison that you're drawing is 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 interesting because I think that it, there are too many similarities to dismiss it as, oh, it's just another missing woman. It's like, no, no, there, there, there is something interesting going on here for sure. Yeah. If you plot it out, you know, just kind of the, the main points of either Holly or Emma's story they're almost interchangeable if you're not too detailed with, you know, the, those main points. But be, before we get into the similarities, I just want to, I want to talk a bit about Holly's story. So you're coming in this fresh, you basically heard my two episodes and probably Googled a little bit about it. What's, what are your initial thoughts? Like what, what did you, what do you think's going on here? So yeah, I listened to your episodes, but then I have to admit I did, after listening to the first one, I took a deep dive. So I did, I did hit, Google hard. I did hit YouTube. I was actually listening to some of her music uh, right before we, we got on here. She's really good. She's re she's amazing. And it's like, that's my style of music that I really like too. So it was, it was interesting. It really kind of pulled me in um, right away. Uh, what really draws me in is the, the frustration of there not being really a tangible lead on what happened like we just know she went missing she walked to the door around four o'clock in january i can't remember what day it was it was january 11th or something like that yeah. um yeah around there on a saturday i think and then you know there was some there was some grainy footage of her walking i think in a uh, a garbage bag that she was obviously trying to use as like a poncho of sorts uh, and then a couple other unconfirmed sightings from my knowledge and it's just so strange like especially when her what really stood out to me jordan was when her dad when you were interviewing him and he was like it's so unlike holly to not 
be in touch with us like why like it's it's not uncharacteristic almost for her to be acting a little strange because it seemed like she was having some issues and the family and friends were used to it but for her to just completely stop communicating and to walk away like that again it kind of like emma it was it wasn't you know she didn't communicate with her family every day she hardly used a cell phone but she always emailed her brother or her mom um you know every few weeks and so to cut you know communication off entirely with with their family that to me right away was like something is seriously wrong very very wrong with her whether it's something happened to her or she is going through something very mm-hmm. difficult with with holly's story so she leaves the house we have about a half hour of little sightings of her you know basically walking up a main road in her area then she completely disappears in emma's story we have the police speaking to her and then she completely disappears with with holly's the kind of the events leading up to it are a little different, but do you have any main theory that you've been favoring going through this as to what, as to what happened with what you know about it at this point? Yeah. I mean, from what I know at this point, and this is why I kind of think I want to write an article about it because I think there are some avenues that could be pursued Mm -hmm. pretty deeply in terms of theories. I think, I think I agree with her dad and obviously, I mean, her family friends know her a lot more than, you know, I do after three or four days of doing some research, but it seems like given what I've heard and what I've read, um, she was definitely going through some sort of mental health issue or episode Uh, again, very, I'm convinced that's also what Emma Filipov was going through as well. Um, there was a really good point, and I can't remember if this was in uh, this was in one of your one of your episodes about her. But you know, basically saying that someone that or no, maybe sorry, it was with someone else. Um, basically saying that someone that vulnerable who might be going through something, walking around in an area like Hamilton. And actually, I I've never been to Hamilton, but I did go to school in Waterloo, which is not that far away from Hamilton. And I you can edit this if you want to, but the, the running joke from the people from Hamilton going to Waterloo was that it's called the asshole of Ontario. <laughs> that, that was the, that was seriously, that was like the label that people in my class from Hamilton were giving the town in Ontario. And I'm sorry if you're from Hamilton, I'm just saying what I heard, <laughs> but that, you know, when you look into it and you look at the stats, Hamilton is a little bit of a, you know, it, it does have a great music scene. There are some great bands. I like think the Arkells are from, from Hamilton. Um, and there is some great music that comes out of there, but there is also something a little edgy about that place. And I think, you know, mi- mixing that with someone who's in crisis, who doesn't know the area, um, who isn't from there, you know, I think foul play isn't something to be ruled out, but I think the evidence so far to answer your question points towards her um, wandering off, uh, maybe a little delusional and having a psychotic episode of some sort. Um, and maybe trying, like her dad suggested, trying to stay hidden based on these perceived fears that she has. So that's what I'm leaning towards. But again, though, you played you played the episode with the last episode and they talked about the hotel, that, that whole inn and what happened there. And, and there may be being some security footage deleted. Like to me, that's that's worth investigating. Yeah, wasn't that a story? That was, we, Elle and I- Insane. Yeah, Elle and I in our interview, she, we were almost at the end and she mentioned the inn a couple times, almost in passing. And then I was like, you know, what happened at the inn? Because I, I did remember in reading, like a mention, I heard a mention of it somewhere, but I never knew anything like that happened. And again, and then I was like, oh, I'll tell you the story. And it was, again, my jaw's like on the floor, like that happened. I, it's it, The way she described it, it played out in my head like a scene in a movie or something. Um, it, it was exactly like a scene in a movie. And to me, it seems like there's something suspect going on there where randomly the the hotel manager asks him to leave for a little bit and then come back weird. and there's footage missing. Yeah. That's weird. And and I should clarify, um, if you are going to put in the bit about what I just said about <laughs> Hamilton, uh, I am from Ottawa, so I am an Ontario native. Uh, so nothing against uh, places in Ontario. It's specific to Hamilton uh, I think the, that you have a problem with. It's, it's specific to Hamilton, but I also think the context is fair because I think there are some places in southern Ontario. I think it is a key point like that could be dismissed if you're not from Ontario, is that places like London and Hamilton, like, like any other place, but they do have um, a rougher side to them. Um, and I have driven through London, especially in, in, in southern Ontario, and, and, and it isn't all very glamorous and there is a lot of crime. So... I think the foul play thing, especially her living so close to that, that uh, was it a budget in or whatever it was called. Um, I mean, I think, I think you just can't rule it out entirely. I don't know. What do you think? Are you, are you on the same page? Absolutely. The same page. It's like no way around the fact that she, she left in a vulnerable state, whether it was exactly. like a, a, a psychotic episode or, 
you know, something actually terrible was happening and going on in reality. Whatever happened, she left uh, vulnerable in seemingly walked into, you know, uh, a, an area with a lot of different possible threats like that. Hearing about that budget in, I went on Google and I looked at pictures and stuff it about budget. it. I think it's called Me budget. And I went and looked at pictures of it. And did you ever see the TV show, The First 48? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, It, it seems like yeah. every episode of The First 48 is filmed like outside like that sort of place. Did you le- read the reviews of the place? Because that's what I went through oh, the Google gosh, reviews. No. And it it sounded like a nightmare. Like yeah. it, it really, really, yeah. So it sounded like a, well, it sounded like a typical rundown place where you go for a cheap room or for nefarious activities. You know, every city has one of those places, I think. I'm sure they do, yeah. It's just yeah. it's pretty uh, inconvenient that a vulnerable young woman goes missing near one and cre- and then there's rumors created that she's in there. So, I can't imagine like hearing that story about her mom pulling the fire alarm. It just speaks to the desperation that the parents would be feeling. Like you would feel so crippled by the different privacy laws and policies that prevent a parent or a loved one from getting access to everything. But to be that close, to be there and, you know, to think something is going on right in front of your eyes, I can get why her mom did that. And I was like, I've never met her mom or spoke to her. But when Elle was telling that story, I was like, yes, mom, like you do it. It's almost like the, uh, the, almost the climax in like a movie. Like, it's like, you know, I think it was heroic to kind of do that. Like, it's like, we're not going to take this, you know, I got what, you know, Elvis said too about, you know, there is bureaucracy and the police are tied, you know, they'd have to get a warrant for each room. But I mean, when you're a parent, like, again, I'm not, and you are, but I can imagine that if something happened to one of your, your childs and you couldn't find them, you're going to do anything you can to get some answers. Like I'd have no problem doing that. And I'm sure, I'm sure Holly's mom felt the same way, but it's just, just to hear it play out in, in the context of learning it. It's a story like that, that it gives you a taste of how desperate and intense, you know, this, this actually is. But yeah, I think uh, I have similar opinions as you and similar thoughts uh, about both cases and and really the point of the two of us meeting and and that's what we're going to get to now is kind of compare and contrast these two stories so both of us have a background in emma Philippoff's story a, a missing woman from victoria well went missing in victoria bc she was 26 at the time um so we both know that story very well you wrote about it i covered it on the podcast now learning about holly's story and the similarities that are there, it's it's almost like when I put out the first episode of Holly's series, immediately I was getting emails from people or comments saying, you know, that's so similar to your episodes about Emma. It's like it, it almost had to be addressed in the podcast. And that's what this episode will be about is our chance for the two of us to kind of talk out some similarities of the cases and kind of cover some of the main similarities that they have. And there are tons of them. So we'll get into some of the similarities between these two cases and we'll start with the similarities between these two young women. Looking at at their personalities, I think it's easy to see Holly and Emma kind of running with the same crowd. Both are seem to be very kind of whimsical, artistic type people. Holly, the musician, and uh, you you said I read already at the beginning, like you've listened to some of her music. Have you ever seen any of the videos of her on stage? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was watching yeah. on YouTube. She, yeah, and she's got a powerful stage yeah. presence. She's, like, I mean, I know she's a tall, tall woman, and she's like, you know, she's very strong to begin with, but like her, she gets into it. Like, yeah, I play guitar, and watching her play that electric, singing like that, yeah. it was it was kind, of, yeah, it was, it, it was kind of like a little bit. A toss up with like Joplin and Winehouse for me. It was, yeah. it, I liked it, it a lot. It you know, I only listened to a couple of songs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was super into it. Yeah. And Emma had an interest in music, but her, Emma's artistic personality or that side of her was more all encompassing. It was the, you know, painting, writing, putting together the rocks and intricate patterns and stuff, as you heard. But either way, that's like the two of them, when you look at these two women side by side, it's, they have, both kind of artistic minds, which again, it's, it's a similarity. Another thing is both of them left home 
to a city that they had little connection to that may have led to them being in a bit more of a vulnerable position. Um, yeah, so you could talk a bit about Emma's and then I'll, about Emma's kind of living arrangements leading up to her disappearance, and I'll do Holly's. Yeah, well, you know, as far as I know about Emma, she had, uh, I think she had moved to the Campbell River originally on Vancouver Island and then back to Ottawa. And I obviously, I, you know, if you want to know more about the Emma story, you can check out, check out uh, Jordan and I's old older episode that we did about that. But, uh, you know, eventually she moved back to Victoria uh, or, or from Ontario back to Victoria and, uh, you know, bounced around. It sounded like kind of couch surfed a little bit or maybe room surfed is a better way to put it uh, in friends' apartments and places and then ended up at a woman's shelter. Uh, and then that's when that's where she went missing. Uh, she left there and, and basically was never seen again. Um, so, you know, I know you're going to talk about Holly, but, you know, I think Emma's was a bit more chaotic and I'm sure we'll talk about that. But she really seemed to not have a home when she moved to the West Coast. Like she was on a boat at one point. Um, you know, people said she slept in a tree in a park. Um, you know, she was staying on people's couches. Um, she did, I think, at times rent a room from friends, but she was definitely um, very much a nomad, I think, when, when she moved out to Vancouver Island, which, it, which, which in all fairness, for context, is a, a lifestyle out here. Vancouver Island is very much does have a very hippie sort of vibe to it in parts. And so it definitely wouldn't be as weird as if you were to do that in like Ottawa, where I'm from, that's very government and, you know, you know, just a bit more uptight and the seasons are a bit more drastic as well. So, yeah, Emma definitely had the transient kind of thing happening. But one thing is, so Holly, her, her situation was she moved to Hamilton basically to be with a guy that she had connections to. That didn't work out, but for whatever reason, she stayed in the city and seemed to have very little connection with anyone. Like she had the one guy who, as Elle said, broke her heart. And then it seemed like she was just kind of trying to put herself out there, maybe trying to get a job that where she would be in a position to meet people or playing at open mics and basically like introducing herself to people on stage like I'm new to the city. Emma had some friends in Victoria. But she was still seemed to be like a lot of the people she was close to were people she met in Victoria. So it was kind of like, I don't know, like I'm sure you can relate to this and anyone who listens can. It's kind of like a new friend that you meet at this point in your, of your life is kind of like one thing and they know this certain side of you. But like a long term friend, it's just different. And so if you're surrounded by people who just know your current state. It's just a different kind of context to exist in than when you're with your friends from high school. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like um, both of them were in a position where they would have been surrounded by people who were really accepting of them to just go their own way because, you know, that's how the, the context that they would know them in. And I just think like, I don't know if that how big of a role that plays in this story, in their stories, but it's just a, it's just a big similarity that both of them had this living arrangement going on. Yeah, I think too, like that's that's a great point. I also think because having, I mean, I'm from Ottawa. I moved to the West Coast uh, five, six years ago on my own. With I knew no one in Vancouver except one person I went to school with in grade eight. Um, I came out, you know, in my mid-20s uh, for adventure and I have stayed because I, 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 I've loved it. Um but it is, I will say, from my own experience, and then you know, having read and listened to Emma's case and now Holly's, it is a very vulnerable, lonely experience at times. Like I still now, like yeah, I miss my family a lot, and it, it is, it's not easy. I guess is what I'm saying. So I guess I can really sympathize with a move that drastic, um, especially because I, from what I understand too, this is important to note. Both of them were relatively close to their families, you know. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that I think Emma probably, like any family, probably had some issues with family members and there was some dynamics there that we'll never understand because that's what family is. And I'm sure the same is with Holly. But I think there was still a lot of love there. I don't think they were running from something that was like very extreme. Um, so I think that's important to note because when you make a decision like that to move away from people you care about and you love and that you're close to, um, I think it's very, it very quickly becomes evident um, how lonely you can be and i think that is that is that is a similarity i see with both of these cases is that um these two people were following their own paths or their own journeys or their own dreams 
but sometimes part of that is experiencing being alone and like you said meeting very casual friends and people who maybe don't really care about you that much because they've just met you they haven't known you their whole life uh and they probably um you know everyone as they get older has their own things going on so the, i think you get empathetically a little a little less for people so I, I think that's important to note too because i think it is harder to form deeper bonds with strangers the older you get um i mean there's obviously exceptions exceptions of course but it's not like when you're kids and you know everyone you meet becomes your best friend and then you know you grow up with those people it's 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 a different time in your yeah. life for sure now the, the next thing the the two the two stories are different in this this way but it, it happens in both of them is the idea of kind of the paranoid behavior kind of kicking in leading up to her, their disappearance in emma's case we have a longer history of it it seemed like her decline if if there was a decline into something it seemed to be more gradual and become more extreme in holly's case it seemed to start out of nowhere as far as her father told me it was like the day before she disappeared she had some loneliness and whatnot and sadness with this breakup but it was like the day before she disappeared is when things turned on in in emma's case we can go back quite a bit further but looking at kind of the trajectory that leads to the moment of their disappearances. Both of them have similar paranoid behavior. I'm being in Emma's case. She had apparently wrote about being stalked or followed. Holly straight up called her parents and described it, but it's just, it's a very similar story. You're right. I think Emma's there from what we know. And I mean, again, a good point too is, you know, Holly only went missing a few months ago. Emma's been missing for a few years. So we know more about Emma's story and case because of that. And maybe, you know, I hope Holly is found and we don't have to learn more about, about her past. But I think, yeah, Emma seemed to be um, like, it, it, it was almost like as you trace her pattern of the last few years before she went missing, there, there becomes a lot of evidence to say that she was battling something to do with mental health. With Holly, it definitely seemed more sudden. Um, I think, uh, you know, the last guest you had uh, basically said, like, her journals suddenly changed within a couple of days of her going missing. And I think, you know, that's a sign of something very sudden coming on. But again, I mean, her dad did allude to her having a really bad panic uh, and anxiety like attack. A, like a year prior, she thought her roommate was, like, poisoning her and stuff. And so something's up. Yeah, something's up. And I think that's that's definitely a similarity between the two of them. Um, you know, I mean, neither of us are, are uh, you know, psychologists or mental health experts. Um, but I think it's fair to say that there was something going on with both of them. Um, and I, as much as it seems like Holly's was sudden, I also got the impression, though, that maybe she maybe she had also had some issues along the way, but maybe didn't know quite what, what was going on. And again, with Emma, it's like we've, we've had a lot more time to, to study that case and, and, and her background. But I do feel like they both they both had something amiss. Yeah, and a good, good point where a lot more time has passed with Emma's story. So more people had a chance to come out and share their experiences with her leading up to that. And, and who's to say with Holly's story that there isn't encounters people had in the days before that maybe would give more information and that just hasn't come out yet. But the the next kind of big kind of touch point in this, and this is one point, one f detail of the two stories that I find is really eerily similar, is the odd phone call to the parents specifically asking for a plane ticket or come and get me and help get me on a plane. Like both uh, Emma made the series of calls to her mom where where she would back and forth between get me a plane ticket, don't get me a plane ticket, come and help me, don't come and help me. Holly, we get to hear that phone call because she left a voicemail and in the episode I played it, but it was when I heard Holly's dad describe it to me, it was the same situation as Emma's. It was, you know, she wanted to come, but she needed help getting there and, you know, and, and they thought maybe she wasn't in the state to even get on the plane. Like, it's just, um, it makes me think how often do the, are those calls made in like how for the two stories to be that similar and have that kind of key phone call right before they disappeared is really odd. And, and not only that is like Shelly arrived in Victoria like hours after 
Emma disappeared. Holly's dad arrived like the next day. It's just really freaky that that phone call set something in motion the exact same way in both of these stories. Yeah, it's almost like the final red flag, you know? It's like that something is wrong, you know? And that's when I think that's when Shelly knew with Emma and that's when uh, Holly's parents knew like that phone call. Like you listen to that voicemail and it's it's eerie. Like it, when I listen to it like it, it it is eerie. It is interesting too. You know, again, not to psychoanalyze too much, but it's it is interesting that she starts it off so distraught, and then by the end, she's almost—I mean, she's not completely recovered, but she's definitely composed herself a lot more. And to me, that's that's someone who's fluctuating in emotions and feelings very quickly. You know what I mean? Did you get that vibe too? Absolutely. That was one of the first things I noticed. She went from like breaking down, defeated, yeah, crying, completely distraught. and it seemed like with the drop of a hat her tone changed and she's like, okay, uh, not that she was up high or anything, uh, in terms of mood, but she was definitely, I've never, I don't think I've, I can't think of a time I've ever encountered something in, in person where someone changed mood that quick. Although I say that I think of lots of times with my kids that I managed to pull them out of it, but usually when I get them out of their, you know, whatever's bothering them, they're still kind of sobbing and, it seemed like it was like a switch change with her, which is really weird. Yeah. So the, I, the, the pause was interesting to me and, and the, the shift of tone in the call, because you, you, like you said, it is really different and unique and it's not, it's not something I've ever heard someone really do again, though, right away. And again, I'm not a mental health expert. I, I don't know. But when I heard that, I immediately thought this is someone who is going through something emotionally and mentally that is extreme. It's intense. And to go from that distraught kind of um, like basically like sounded like they're fearing for their life at the beginning of the call to going to like, hey, well, I love you. I hope to talk to you soon to kind of like being more composed was a little it was very strange to me. And I think that I think that does speak to probably what's in her journal um, and probably whatever other people have seen from her behavior the last couple of days is that. You know, she probably was um, battling something and, and trying to, if you don't know what it is, it's a really scary thing. So I can imagine your emotions are all over the place. And and I, and I honestly, it sounds like Emma was kind of the same way uh, the few days before she disappeared. Like she had moments where, you know, she looked very sullen and sad, but then had these like manic moments where she was like pushing furniture outside and almost being kind of aggressive, like it sounded like her emotions were also kind of all over the place. So to me, that speaks of some sort of crisis of, of, of the mind and of mental yeah. health, you know? And then when we think of someone who's struggling and at risk in some way, we often think, hopefully the police can come and help them. Oddly, in both of these cases, right at the last minute, the police were there and it didn't help them. Um, maybe you can talk about the, how the police were or what we know about the police's involvement with Emma's story and we'll can't compare it with Holly's. Yeah. So from what I understand, uh, the police from Emma's story, uh, she was walking around downtown uh, near the Empress Hotel and a friend or acquaintance, probably probably more of an acquaintance showed up named Dennis Quay. Um, and he noticed that Emma wasn't wearing shoes and she was didn't look particularly well um there's not a lot of details because uh as far as i know dennis hasn't done really any or or very few interviews but she was basically um he was concerned enough to call the police um to check on her well-being so he i think at one point he uh, made some sort of excuse and stepped off and stepped into a restaurant used their phone and called the police they showed up somewhere downtown and right in front of the empress right on the water talked to emma from what i understand for about 40 minutes or so, and then basically decided that she wasn't a risk to herself or others and took off. Um, and then, of course, we, you know, there's, there's, yeah, like there's people maybe saw Emma again later that night or maybe the next morning, but really that's the last real confirmed sighting we have of, of, of Emma Filipov. Um, from what, you know, and you made a good point about this during the show about Emma, uh, a lot of people right away would say, well, the police should have done more. They have a set of rules and procedures they have to go through when people are in crisis like that. And if they don't deem them to be a threat to themselves or others, there's not a lot they can do. And I think if the police spent 40 minutes with Emma, 
they probably did their due diligence or probably trying really hard to get her to admit she needed to go to a hospital or something, but just couldn't do it. They, I mean, they can't just put her in the back of a police car and drive away. That's not, you know, that's infringing on, no, it's, it's infringing on her civil liberties and a lot of other things, right? I mean, I'm not an expert of the law either, but there is a process they have to go through. And I know you've done an episode uh, kind of clearing that up a little bit because it is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, but yeah, that's that's basically the circumstances. The cops talked to to Emma for about forty minutes. Decided, you know, she wasn't obviously okay, but um, you know, she wasn't harmed herself or others. So they they had to move on. They had to go do their job somewhere else, basically. Yeah. And with Holly's case, a very similar story. We we heard Holly's dad describe how after those calls were made, Holly's dad or Holly's parents sent uh, her both her brother and her sister separately to check on her. Neither were able to even like get in her room to talk to her. Her brother phoned 911 reporting her as being in distress. And the police come and the way Dave, Holly's dad, described it is they didn't get in her room either. They spoke to her through the door in, of her bedroom and asked her questions like, you know, are you going to hurt yourself? Are you going to harm someone else? Just those kind of – I'm sure a lot of the same questions Emma was asked. And Holly answered them in such a way that – Either they felt genuinely that she was okay or they didn't have enough to kick the door down and take her to a hospital or something, somewhere one or the other. But needless to say, 911 was called, the police responded, asked her enough questions that led to them leaving her there. In Holly's case, it was the next morning she disappeared. In Emma's case, she wasn't seen again, confirmed sighting of after that interaction with the police. But it's just when you're going through these tragic stories of of all these odd things happening, ending in a disappearance, in both of these stories, we have the police dropped in at this pivotal moment, but it's just not enough to change the course of what appears to be the tragedy in, in, in both of the stories. Or if not tragedy, something very unusual um the police procedure wasn't able to stop it in, in either case um which is just very it's surprising but it also makes me question how these kind of mental health calls are handled if if there's these two stories that are this similar in in either case the police weren't able to change the the course of of the event it's it's kind of dark well, and these are the two we're able, you and I are able to connect. I'm sure maybe you're going to get emails after this saying of a third, fourth case that is eerily similar. Like maybe, you know, maybe it is a thing where, yeah, maybe the police do, um, they have challenges when addressing how, what to do when someone's in a mental health crisis. I mean, you know, they're there to enforce and protect, but, you know, what do you do to, to help someone who doesn't even really know what's going on with them, but isn't a threat to anyone else. It's it's a precarious yeah, situation. Absolutely. In hindsight, it's 2020. And like it's you can't go around arresting people because they're acting strange or weird. We have like, although it's not in Canada, but in the United States right now, there's people protesting because the government's declared a, you know, a state of emergency and wants people to not open their businesses and people are protesting. Imagine if you're going around arresting them because they're barefoot. And, you know, in, in expressing themselves in odd ways. So it's, you know, it is such a slippery, delicate slope. But and that's why I think it's almost like there needs to be a different kind of division beyond police that handle this. Because like a police officer, although there's different types with different levels of training or whatever, to, to meet with a, an Emma Filipov or a Holly Clark in the midst of what appears to be some kind of crisis and to have the skills to handle that is a lot different than what you would need to break up fights outside of the bar and arrest shoplifters. And, you know, it's it's just it's such a it's such a, a distance away from a lot of other police activities to be able to be a master of these delicate environments. So I get the complicated nature of the situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So now the, the next thing that we'll, we'll talk about is there, there's so many, like, as I go through it, I have a list of similarities that goes on and on. Like we don't need to talk about this, but oddly enough, both of them were carrying garbage bags right around the time of their disappearance. So we heard of Emma 
having garbage bags and like kind of like bags over her shoulders and so like shopping bags and stuff. Holly, we don't even need to hear about it. You have we have video of Holly walking first wearing a garbage bag like a poncho, then a couple minutes later wearing a garbage bag as a poncho with another garbage bag over her shoulder that looks to be half full of things. Then a couple minutes later, she's seen again in video wearing the garbage bag as a poncho without the garbage bag of stuff over her shoulder. And that could all be red herrings, but it just makes me think like, you know, whether we're talking about Holly or Emma, I'm thinking like, what the heck did they have with them? Maybe it was they were in some kind of delusional state where maybe it was just a bag of garbage. But it still begs the question, like, what was... Yeah, it sounds could like... Could that be a clue or... Yeah it, yeah, it 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 could be. Like, it sounds like in both cases, I got the impression that it was maybe, like, a few personal belongings and, and a couple elements of clothing. But, I mean, again, with Holly, though, I think she only took her wallet, right? Like, she left her phone yeah, at and, her room. And she was... Yeah, she didn't take anything else. Yeah, there was photos of her leaving her apartment. She didn't have anything. So yeah, so she got the bag from somewhere else. So yeah, uh, that's that's very it's like, strange. Yeah, it's that, like what the is heck is strange. that? And just a weird coincidence between the two. It is. Also, I don't know many people who keep a journal. Both Emma and Holly kept a journal that appears to have give some indication of a decline or crisis or whatnot. We've we've talked about Emma's a lot in my episodes, but we've heard it described of as like kind of a mix between a narrative and creative writing and poetry. Holly's, we didn't get too into it, but it seems to be like I'm picturing a lot of the same kind of stuff. What Elle had described to me about Holly's journals was not only was what she writing seeming to get forth like some kind of a decline but even the way she was writing seemed to be kind of a little more disorganized or whatnot but it's just in both of these stories there's a journal there which is for anyone who if like if you're someone who likes a mystery adding a journal to a mystery it just opens up these other layers or something so it almost feels like if agatha christie wrote a missing person's case there would be a journal left behind yeah, and it's it is I think a reflection of both of them being um artists, you know, and being expressionists and wanting to write their feelings or doings down whether or not they wanted people to see it, but it is really interesting. Yeah, and I think that with the uh, garbage bags like Again, could be just red herrings. I mean, the one thing about the journals I think that is really valuable though is you do get an insight into something happening before they go missing. With in Holly's case, especially, it sounds like something deteriorated. Like her actual handwriting was affected by the way she was feeling. So that that's got to tell you something about her mental state. Um, you know, Emma's again. You know, she has an entry that a lot of people have thought could have been a suicide note, which a lot of people said no. It's just her way of being creative and exploring really heavy topics. So the journal is is. The journals of both of them is very interesting. Yeah. And it also frees up – like I didn't know about this concept until recently, but there's a concept called a um, – I think it's called a psychological autopsy. And it's after mm-hmm. – it's like interviewing people and looking at evidence of someone's behavior and personality and trying to diagnose them after the fact. And we had the tragedy in Nova Scotia a few weeks ago with the mass shooting. And there's yes. there's now – it's it's the RCMP have announced that – they're they are having a psychological autopsy done on the shooter or the gunman or whatever you want to call him to try to figure out maybe what a part of his motivation was. I'm just thinking if you wanted to get in the head of either of these by like with a professional, having that journal there is where its personal writings to themselves must be like a gold mine of information to someone with a background in that, but Absolutely. But yeah. then again, then that begs the question, though, like, would that even bring you any closer to finding them? So it's, you know, all these things with it, with a missing person's case, especially one with the layers, as either of these stories do, is everything we're talking about could be red herrings that are completely irrelevant to the one fact that will answer the question as to what happened. But it's still, you know, you kind of have to look at everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, the, the next thing we we talked a bit of about the area where Holly was living, Hamilton, maybe being a little spot that was rough around the edges. But I just to compare, 
or however you want to pull, you, you so eloquently refer to you it as the it, asshole. You said it much. Better, you said it much well, better than my I did, mom yes. listens to this man. Um, <laughs> but one thing that both areas have in common. So Emma disappeared in Victoria, last seen outside the Empress Hotel. Which, if you go on Google Maps and look right. at where she was, she was basically at the harbor. Like she was looking. Oh, the inner harbor. She was right there in yeah. the water, like right at the water. In in Holly's yep. case, also disappeared in urban area. Hamilton's a city. Um, she was walking the direction that she was walking. If you're on Google Maps and you look at the street she was on and the way she was walking, you just have to zoom out a little bit and you see water. It's just to me, it's right. if you were going to make a movie of either of these stories, they could be put in the same kind of setting, like an, an urban city on the water. You know, on a cold, rainy night, it's just, it's yeah. just so strange. Well, there's another the weather. Yeah. The weather was eerily similar as mm-hmm. well. Like a little bit of rain, it was probably a little colder in Hamilton in in January. But I think that's a factor that can't be ignored. And honestly, when you gave me this list of of similarities that you wanted to talk about, that was the one I circled because I still think, um, in Emma's case especially whether she escaped and left and went somewhere else by water or she unfortunately met her, um, you know, demise in water. I think it has something to do with it. It's, it's too hard. It's, it's such an easy way to vanish one way or the other. I mean, especially the Pacific ocean, like you, you, you know, whether you're on a boat or you try and swim or whatever it is, I, I think it's a factor. And I think when you, when you put, brought that up and then I actually, when I mapped the budget in, on Google Maps today, and I looked at how close Lake Ontario is to... I didn't realize that it was that close to where this happened, and I was like, that's a factor. I mean, I, who knows how much of it it is, but I think it's hard yeah. to explain. And, and the same right? with Emma's. Like, she she was right, yeah. right there. But that said, both of these women, Holly and Emma, although disappearing in an urban area near water, both of them made a habit of leaving the urban area to explore the rural area. So Emma did these long That's walks through the, you know, outside of the, the the city. Holly did these long bike rides where she would kind of explore the 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 wilderness outside of Hamilton. So both of them, although disappearing in that scenario, weren't um, scared to travel off outside of the city and you know get into the woods. So it it just kind of broadens the area you would want to search and broadens the possibilities of where they may be and what may have happened. But again, just the similarities is just so weird. It is weird. It's very strange. Mm-hmm. Now, looking back on it or looking at both of these stories from our, our present point of view, we have a lot of the same information, a lot of the same possibilities. One thing that I find eerily similar when I was talking to both Holly's dad and and L, the volunteer who's helping them. What reminded me so much of Emma's story is so many of the leads that they're getting and tips that they're getting are these vague sightings of quasi homeless people who may or may not look like Holly or Emma. And those leads being fruitful, like being something like what's kind of driving the search now is reacting to these tips and leads. I just felt like um, both stories are kind of at the same point where there's very little new concrete information that would make you jump in one direction or another. Instead, it's, I think I saw her at this place. So we, you know, go search and hang posters there. It's just, when I was talking to Ellen Dave, I was just so much of me was like, you're thinking like the, it's exactly where Emma's story has been for, for so long now, as far as the search. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it's it's very eerie how many similarities they are based on the sightings. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting, though, and I, I know you're trying to go for similarities here, but one discrepancy, and maybe this is something we just don't know about, but I thought it was interesting that Holly's family was talking so much about getting ransom uh, calls. That was weird to me because I was like, I don't recall that happening with Philippop. I mean, maybe it did, and maybe Shelly didn't want to share it or – you know, and I understand why there are a lot of crackpots out there, like trying to, you know, get attention. But it was really strange because I remember when you even asked me, like, "Oh, this is a one-off." He's like, "No, this has happened three times already." And I was like, "That's really strange to me." Um, 
And that, that was really interesting. You know, I that, just wonder, that struck a nerve. Yeah, I just wonder if there are people out there, like just uh, like thinking like how evil this would be if there's people out there who search for missing persons cases and write ransom notes trying to get some money out of these people. Like if, you know, there's all sorts of scams going on of like, you know, that oh, prey sure. on the elderly or prey on the vulnerable in one way or another. I got, I got a bunch of emails where it was like, it was pretending to be from a, a drugstore that was offering like, you know, medicine related to the coronavirus and stuff. And I'm just thinking yeah. like you pricks like to take advantage <laughs> yeah. of this. But yeah. as, as awful as it would be. I thought your mom listened to this. What are you doing? Pricks isn't that bad. <laughs> but <laughs> as, as awful as it would be to prey on people terrified of the coronavirus, it would be so much worse to write to tip lines dedicated to a certain missing persons case and try to get five hundred dollars to get a photo of their missing loved one like to me it's that disgusting. it's disgusting yeah. and if yeah. it happened to them three times and they're willing to tell me that i'm bet you it happens to it probably happens to a lot of these stories especially the well-known ones like emma's or ryan stuka's maybe their families are just aren't out there saying it i don't i don't know but if it happened to them three times that seems a little weird can I ask you one question going back to the similarities? Because like you said, there are, uh, and sorry for that tangent, but there, there are, like you said, a lot of weird similarities of there being video clips of these two people before they completely vanish. What did you think? Because I remember we talked about what we thought when we saw Emma and the 7-Eleven. What did you think of the, and I'm talking about the confirmed clip of Holly where she's wearing the, the, the garbage bag as like a kind of like a yeah. poncho. What do you what do you think of that clip when you see her walking like that? I know it's brief and not a lot happens, but what did yeah. you think when you saw that? I watched it a bunch of times. For for one, she did have a very distinct gait, like the way she walked. It wasn't. It was kind of like the sort of like limpy shuffle kind of thing, uh, which would make it easier to identify her in other video if when there's other these sightings come up or whatever. And she's also very tall. And like in the video, she she's a, a large person with a distinct walk. Very much so. She seems to really be like on a mission. Like she looks if, – if I saw her, I would think this is someone who's like has somewhere they got to get. That's, that's, that's why I asked you. That's the first thing I thought. Like she looks to me as someone who has to get somewhere and isn't – She's got something going on in her head that it's easy. she's either late or she's worrying about something. Like she looks, she's, uh, she's stomping towards something. Like I was like, she looks like she almost looked upset, like angry mm -hmm. in the in the video. And I was like, that's the one difference again with from Emma. Is you see the videos of Emma, she's much more timid. You know, looking at the window, making sure people aren't following her. It's like you no, know, Holly's like. I mean, again, maybe she could just want me to get out of the rain. Like who could blame her? It looks like it's mm -hmm. pouring in the video. But I did, mm -hmm. I did, I'm glad you noticed that too, because I was like, I very much thought she was striving towards something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it's, um, if I saw, if she, if I was walking down the sidewalk and she passed by me walking and carrying the bag and stuff, I would assume she had something in there that she just had to get it. So, like, I would think like maybe she's, you know, carrying something of value to a friend's house and she's trying to get there quick yeah. or something, but she does seem like she's doing something. Yeah. You know what the feeling I get now that I've, we've talked about Holly and I, I've gone down that hole and, and I spent a lot of time researching Emma's case. feel like, it's nags at me, but something's missing. You know, I feel like we're we, we're always missing something, despite all the information that we have. That almost could kind of. I think that's probably how the family and friends feel too. To kind of lock this all together for it to make sense, and that to me is kind of my takeaway. It's 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 it nags at you, and it nags at me. Like I don't I don't know what it is, or or if it's an interview, or someone we need to talk to, or a detail, or something we're overlooking or underlooking. But it does feel like with these two cases, there is something that we are inherently missing in the timeline or whatever that doesn't make either of these disappearances make a lot of sense. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And it's I find that applies not only to a missing persons case, but to most mysteries at the at the end of it, at the end of the day, you have kind of like using the um, analogy of like a puzzle. You have a collection of puzzle pieces none of which fit together in any logical way. 
And you don't know if you even have all of the pieces. So at the end of it, you just have these random puzzle pieces on the floor that may not even be for the same puzzle. And that's kind of the way I see both of these stories. You have these different facts you know, but the the all of those facts put together don't create one obvious thing. There's either not enough. Some of the facts may have nothing to do with what we're looking at. Yeah, I think something's missing. I think um, that's what makes a missing person's case something that can capture the public's attention the way it does, both because of the tragedy and the the empathy we have for the families and the need to put resolution to this you know heartbreak that's going on, but the public, especially getting into like these online sleuth kind of communities. Both of which these cases, Emma's and Holly's, have a bunch of people online theorizing and speculating. It just – the mystery and whether or not all the puzzle pieces are on the floor really fuels a lot of conversation. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. And we have um, one last thing that I want to end with and, I, and I'm not ending with it because I think this is the answer to the to the whole mystery – or um, or any grand kind of finale. It's just something that came my way right before we started uh, planning to get together and chat, and I it just struck a nerve with me. And I thought the this clip of audio is important. This is um I got an so on my website there's a spot where you can contact me and you can write an email. It has links to my Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. But it also has a spot where you can send me a voice memo, and randomly. Like we're on your phone, you can just record a memo and it'll email it to me and I can record my voice and write back. I just randomly got an email from somebody um, through the, or a voice memo from somebody who listened to the episodes about Holly and they wrote to me sharing their opinion on maybe what was going on with both of these women. And it just so happened that while you and I were planning to do this episode, I got this voice memo that was also comparing and contrasting the two cases. Um the guy who who sent me the voicemail, his name is Peter Junker, and he is um, a listener of the show. He's also an author. He wrote a book called uh, Things Will Get Worse. And what makes Peter unique and what makes his comments so important is he suffers from bipolar disorder. And in fact, his book, Things Will Get Worse, it's a book of poetry where a lot of it is about kind of like life and living with bipolar disorder. And he decided to express himself in poem. But anyway, he sends me a voicemail discussing um, these two women uh, from from his point of view. So let's listen to it. Then we'll, we'll chat it out a bit. Okay. Hi, Jordan. There was a lot of speculation that mental illness was involved in Emma's and Holly's disappearances. And based on my own experience, it seems very clear that there was mental illness involved. Um, The question came up, I think, in both discussions about whether there was some kind of schizophrenia going on. And I want to suggest that there is a whole different category of uh, mental health, mental illness, that can exhibit itself in a psychotic event, which is bipolar mania. People think they know about the pendulum of moods, that things swing back and forth, but folks don't know the finer points of bipolar disorder. Um, In my own case, I had my first signs of bipolar mania and psychosis at age 16, but I wasn't diagnosed until 29 or 30. Um, And I just think some aspects of the women's stories sound like bipolar disorder to me. The mysterious disappearances of the women were preceded in both cases by mysterious behavior, things that were out of character or at least unusual. They both had very emotional conversations with their parents in the days before. Um, In Emma's case, her shoelessness struck me, from my experience again, as a kind of sprightly euphoria 
that's on the high end of hypomania. Um, and in Holly's case, it, it seems like there was uh, some sort of bipolar psychosis going on. Um, in my own experience with bipolar psychosis, I had a couple of events. One of them was I was uh, in a disturbed emotional state and it was like there was a mob outside my house ready to come and grab me. Now that sounds to me a lot like Holly's uh, conviction that two men were following her around and her kind of paranoia. Um, and again, the way that Holly and Emma were behaving before their disappearances just feels to me like there could have been some bipolar disorder. Now, I think that's especially the, true in Holly's case. Um, the fact that Emma was residing in a homeless shelter for a number of days suggests something more long-term to me than just a, a case of bipolar mania. Um, again, I can't diagnose anybody, but based on my own experience, I can imagine myself acting very much like Emma and Holly before their disappearances. What makes me think that they might be suffering from bipolar disorder? Um, a few things. One is the fact that they were highly accomplished and focused when they were young. Um, it doesn't be a, become a problem until it becomes more malignant, which is why it tends to come out in young adulthood with the stresses of adulthood and maybe just the development of the disease. Um, the other reason is that both Emma and Holly were extremely creative types and artistic people, people with artistic ability and personalities are actually demonstrably overrepresented in the number of people with bipolar disorder. And, and finally, the worst case scenario, I think um, that there may have been some foul play involved, uh, I wonder about because when you're in a disturbed emotional state like that, you, um, two things. First of all, it calls attention to yourself from other people that you are unstable. And secondly, it just messes up your decision making. And both those things uh, really increase your chances of becoming a victim. Anyway, that's my two cents. Um, I hope it adds something to the conversation. Thanks. Yeah, I think Peter, at least in, in my opinion, Peter makes a lot of good points there. Yeah. Yeah, I really think he does. Uh, I think it's really interesting. He sounds like he has a lot of firsthand experience with it. And um, everything he says when I listened to that, I was like, I was nodding the entire time. Like, yeah, that makes like, sense. Yeah. yeah, like there's, it, it kind of, it does fill in a lot of gaps for me. Um, it's... It's interesting. It's also kind of sad too to hear Peter talk about that and and to hear you know yeah. to hear that. And I didn't know a lot. Like I, I guess I know what the average person would about bipolar disorder. The idea of the big mood swings between like depression and you know the super excited mania mania or whatever kind of thing. But but hearing uh like after listening to him and being kind of like just like you described nodding along like, yep yep i went and google did a bit of research on it and yeah just the more i read the more i i guess i i wish i had known more about bipolar before this because it does i don't i don't know what i just the more i learn about it and think about these cases the more i think it's it could possibly have been something that was happening I, again i'm no expert on it but he knows what he's talking about i can tell and he just made a, a, a lot of good points and it just even just now listening to him it listening to him describe that i thought back of what we were talking about earlier with her voicemail where she was really swinging mm -hmm. um talking about holly she was really swinging between just like grief and kind of this frantic um like distraught kind of tone at the beginning and then all of a sudden swinging to a like a completely different mood towards the end of that phone call and it just I don't know. It, he could be right. He, and and he also described at the end where, you know, whether or not the mental illness or the psychosis or whatnot is what causes the problem, 
it definitely will put you at a in a vulnerable position if you know Emma's shoeless disoriented walking around downtown or Holly's carrying around a garbage bag dressed in a garbage bag you know roaming around town it's uh, if there's someone out there looking to do harm to an attractive young woman uh these two will make it known that they're or, or appear to be making it known that they're in a vulnerable state yeah and to me, the few things I do know about bipolar uh, or bipolarity is that, uh, you know, it tends to people who do have it tend to be drawn to the arts. I mean, there's a lot of artists like Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I think there's rumors that John Lennon might have had it. Like, there's a lot of people who are very creative who suffer from that disorder. And also, I do know that a lot of people don't get diagnosed with it until a little later in their uh, sort of young, um, you know, uh, adulthood. So like late twenties, yeah. early thirties. So, I mean, to the me, exact age that, yeah, that exact age up. these two artistic 26, people were, right? Like, and I mean, both of them were undoubtedly creative, a little different and eccentric in their own way. So, yeah, when basically just you know reiterating what you were saying, what Peter was saying, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And mm -hmm. I, but the thing is, it doesn't answer the questions. You know, what happened? It's just yeah, maybe it's just a catalyst a, for what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's like, it's maybe another one of the puzzle pieces on exactly. the floor. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's sad. These stories are, are tragic and sad. Um, I think, uh, especially so in Holly's it's so like this, when we talk about Emma, we're talking about something that happened years ago. The trail is, growing colder every day and it's harder to get new leads in Holly's case. We're talking about a disappearance five months ago. So yeah. it's, you know, when the pandemic's over, I'm sure her friends and family are going to be in Hamilton beating the streets again, looking for any trace of her. And I, I do think that there's a high potential of, you know, something happening this summer locating her or at least answering the question as to what happened. Yeah, and I really hope so too. Uh, that you know they don't have to keep waiting for an answer like Emma Filipov's family is doing. You know that's that's a long, painful road. So it would be nice to get some sort of closure or answer. Um, but one thing I did want to say was that um, you know I think the, I hope the people that listen to this episode that if any of them did live with Holly um, or in the same house um, and know more than maybe they're afraid to tell people about or they think they have anything that might be useful now is not the time to be embarrassed or to be unsure like you know you you should be um telling at the very least the police you know what you know so that we can you know people can the family and everyone else can figure out what happened to holly and where she is um you know i got a lot i got a big uh, this from the you know the what was alluded to in the last couple of interviews you did that the people who lived with Holly last may not have been being super helpful and uh, I mean obviously I'm not privy to the situation but I would just say that like regardless of what's going on now is the time to to say and and reveal whatever you know because who knows like we've talked about so many times of these cases Jordan you you don't know what little detail is going to break these things wide open so mm -hmm. anything is yeah. relevant and to me this almost reminds me of like Dennis Quay like. You know, the last people to see her alive, uh, or not missing anyways, we don't know if Holly's not alive, was her roommates. And, you know, Dennis Quay, um, you know, he has chosen not to speak out, and that's that's totally fine. And I hope he's spoken out to the right people if he has. But I just kind of think of the same thing in this moment. I'm like, the last people to see someone before they go missing are the most important. And I just hope they know that, you know, whatever min minute detail I think is not important, it very well could be. Yeah, I would love to talk to them. I would love to hear from someone who is living in that home just to get a sense. Like, it's one thing to hear Holly's dad or Elle talk about it, but I'd love to hear from someone who is there who can better explain what was going on. I hope to be able to do that in a future episode, but at um, I would much rather them contact the police and tell them everything they know. Yeah, if they know anything. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I would still love to hear one of them on your show. That's kind of why I brought it up. <laughs> I was call to action. I was like, yeah, I would, I would love for you to, uh, to talk to one of them. So yeah. hopefully that happens. Yeah. Well, hopefully the cases are solved and we don't have to do yeah. far. And the follow up episode can be Holly. That's a good point. Talking about all the great adventures she's had the last few months with us on the show. But 
either way, uh, Tyler, I'm glad to have you on to talk this stuff out because it's um, this was good. This is a conversation that wouldn't have been appropriate or comfortable with someone as close to the story as Dave or L. But for people who are interested in the story, listening to us talk have has hopefully created a bunch of new rabbit holes and ideas for them to look into. But again, it's uh, always awesome to have you on the show. So I appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you, Jordan. I always uh, appreciate and love coming on. So thank you. I want to thank you for joining Tyler and I in our discussion surrounding the tragic coincidences shared by Holly Clark and Emma Filipoff. Although our conversation focused on the similarity, these are two very different women with their own unique and important lives. In my experience, after meeting members of both Holly and Emma's families, the most striking similarity between the two, and certainly the most important one, is that they are incredibly loved by a family who desperately wants them back. And with that, we'll end this episode of Nighttime. Now before we part, I want to end with thanks. First, a huge thank you to Tyler for again taking the time to join the show as co-host. Also, a big thanks to the Canadian band Paragon Cause, who provide the musical theme for this episode. And lastly, but most importantly, a huge thank you to the listeners of Nighttime. Without you, this show would have seen the light of day many moons ago. And with that said, if you want more Nighttime, let me suggest the premium feed. For about the price of a cup of coffee, you can access a separate feed in which the episodes are posted earlier than in the free feed, and are done so without paid advertising. But beyond the regular episodes, the premium feed also includes the Nightcap After Show episodes in which I and a guest climb a bit deeper down the rabbit hole. You can access the premium feed at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. For anyone else who'd like to support the show but can't help financially, you can give me a big hand by simply telling your friends about me and leaving a positive review on Apple Podcasts or whichever equivalent you're using. If any of you listening want to stay up to date with my activities on or off the show, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I use the handle at NighttimePod. If you have any story ideas or want to give feedback on the show, I'd love to hear from you at NighttimePodcast at gmail.com. Now, until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and keep your eyes open for Holly Clark and Emma Filipov. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte. Copyright Jordan Bonaparte.